And nothing says we have a fab show coming your way, folks, like our first guest tonight, who just happens to be one of the greatest Irish singers to ever draw breath. She's worked with everyone from Smokey Robinson to Lou Reed and her vocal talents are only surpassed by her ability to tell a story and song on stage and on the big screen and now in her latest documentary about two other Irish trailblazers. Would you welcome Imelda May! <laughs> How are you getting on? Oh. Hi. Welcome to the show. Feeling Thank a wee you. bit of the love. Feeling the love. Feeling yeah. the love. St. Patrick Kilty. St. Patrick Kilty. It's never been said before, to be fair. Um, and I, I, got... I know the band, the lovely bunch. Hello. Good to see you again. There we go. It's nice. <laughs> It's nice They're to brilliant. see them sober, isn't it? <laughs> there they are. They're brilliant musicians, they are really good people. They're good people. Yeah. Uh, and we've got to congratulate you on your new documentary, Lily. Congratulations and to you on The Late Late Show. Thank you very much. <laughs> no, you. <laughs> no, you and your new show. No, you. Uh, Lily and Lolly, the Forgotten Yet Sisters. Yes. On Sky Arts. Yeah. Let's get you with your Sky Arts. Uh, so, this is an amazing story. Uh, it's about two Irish sisters who basically had to make their own way, earn their own money. They kept the men in their lives mm -hmm. and they got no thanks for it. So how did a woman in the music business first become attracted to this project? Uh, well, I'm a, uh, I'm a fan of uh, WB8 and Jack B8 since I was a teenager. You know me, I've, I've, I'm one of those people of books all over the house, yeah. all up the sides of the bed, and it's ridiculous. I, I read a lot. Um, and so I, I was fascinated by the Yates family. However, I was doing a gig, uh, it must be about seven years ago or more, in Three Arena, and I was wanting to project the names of great people, great Irish people, predominantly Irish women, behind me for this song that I was doing. And as I started delving, I discovered um, a bit about the Yates sisters, and I was really um, was upset with myself that I'd not heard of them before, and I wondered why. And I dug and I asked around, and not a lot of people had heard of them, um, or not enough people have heard of them. So I decided I want to tell their story, and so I've been harping on about them since that. And then I did uh, Voices of Ireland with Maggie Brannock, and we worked so well together on that documentary. She said, "Do you?" You know, is there something else you'd like to work on? And I said, I know exactly what that is. What do you That's, want to work on? And, and it's, it's an amazing story. Uh, they, they set up their own embroidery company. They set up their own printing press. Their work ended mm -hmm. up in the Vatican. Their books were yes. launching new Irish writers. Yeah. And the money they were making, they were keeping their dad. They were paying... Uh, their dad asked if he'd... He was a barrister and he decided that he wanted to become a painter and he was a great painter and the, the two main portraits of them are in the National Art Gallery by... By the dad. The dad. He was brilliant. However, he was brilliant and he'd say, can you send me over money for a little while? And they paid for him for 11 years and they sent money to, to William and uh, they were really keeping the family home while the men were heading off doing their thing but they kept the home through making great art and uh, through embroidery, they were the best embroiderers. And that's why we can't find a lot of their stuff because it went over to, off to the Vatican. Not because they were particularly religious, but because that's where the they bread were, was buttered. Yeah, they, they were, were the commissioned. commissioned. Yeah. And, uh, and then they, also, they, they also employed all women. Only women. Yeah, in and the printing press. They became um, publishers and printers. It was no, normally only men were printers at the time. You had to serve a vocation for seven years and don't gamble or don't get married. Elizabeth went over and learned how to be a printer in four weeks and then taught all the women how to do this. And they, could, they would have been in trouble and they would have been brought to court because it, uh, it, uh, it was against all the unions to um, employ women at that time. They did only women. And importantly, they only published, or mostly only published, new authors. 
um, not uh, well established, which they could have made money for. So without them, we wouldn't have had JM Singh and T.S. Eliot and loads of other people. And, and look, you, you tell the story so well and the documentary is made so beautifully and... Red Shoe Productions is brilliant as well. We worked well together, sorry. No, no I was going to say just, just at the end, whenever yeah. Yeah, I thought that this is amazing, then at the end you give us a wee tune as well. So we have a clip here of you giving them the proper sound. I'm embarrassed by that. You I should, just you, got emotional and I started singing don't, don't, the grave. Don't be embarrassed by do. this. The, the, this, is, uh, this is whenever you visited the grave and, yeah. uh, and you give them a bit of a tune. Check this out. Good night and joy be with you all So fill to me the parting glass Good night and joy be with you all So I was just, I was actually just singing with a little bird. Mm. So we, the, we found, found the grave and the grave was in bits and the lettering was coming off. So we decided to do up the grave and then we went back to have a look at it. And this little bird started singing. So I was actually just singing with the little bird. It felt, it felt right. And speaking of embroidery, mm. I would like to mention, this is, uh, I would like to show my solidarity with the Palestinian people. And mm. um, this has been... <laughs> This is embroidered, this is Tatri's embroidery from Palestine um, done by a couple of Palestinian sisters which ties in with the embroidery on the sisters and these are the Tatri sisters and they make pieces of art where they put their lives and embroider their lives into them and I want to say, I want to show me solidarity to them and to peace and to... Uh, and, and for peace and love and against war and children being harmed and maimed and against genocide and against occupation and also for Jewish people who use their voices to fight for peace as well because that's tough too. So I wanted to show me solidarity and I wanted to wear this beautiful piece of Tatri's embroidery and, uh, and show the love, especially on Women's Day, International Women's Day. <laughs> If you the women keep the things going. The don't women we, keep the things we going. We keep it all yeah. going. Yeah, right with that. Um, I want to talk to you about uh, a couple of people who, for us normal people, were musical heroes that we lost this year. Sinead and, and Shane, but for you, they were just great, great pals. Yeah. Um, Shane, I think you said uh, he was too brilliant for his own good. Yeah. Uh, what, what's your memories of Shane? There's plenty to pick from, I'm sure. Plenty of nights crack. Um, a, lot, I, a lot of people don't realise that Shane was a lover. He was full of love. He was full of peace and joy and like deep spiritual love. He was very spiritual. And if you listen to his songs, they're love songs and they're... He, he liked to fight for the underdog. You know, he liked to, to, to write about the underdog, but he was just so, so brilliant. The way he plays with words, and he's a literary genius. He's, he's certainly up there with, with Brendan Bain and the likes of that is the way he, he, he works his words. But he was just, uh, when we'd go on to, before that, I have to mention I lost, I've had 12 months of it. Um, you've my been good through, you've friend, been, you have been through the ringer this Jeff year. Jeff Beck, um, my good pal Jeff Beck, uh, he died. Uh, in January, I was with him in January and, and uh, I was singing to him. And, uh, and then, of course, Sinead and Shane, of course, we lost Christy as well, and then me dad. So it's been one of them years. But in between, I made a documentary and uh, made a couple of movies and um, I've poured myself into, well, art has kind of saved me and my daughter because you have to crack on. And art has that beautiful thing of you throw yourself into it. And, and the guys over there, two, two of your lovely musicians over there were Sinead's band, and uh, they're having a loss as well, and they throw themselves into Carl music. Carl and Kenny, and yeah. Carl and it's and that, Kenny, it's that thing, isn't it? They're great people, yeah. And I, I love them very much, yeah. 
it, it, it's that thing where... I loved Sinead so much. She was my pal. And you used to ring her up. You used to ring her up and you guys used to put the world to rights and you could talk in a way that nobody else could talk to each other. Yeah, very much so. I'd, yeah, yeah. We'd, we'd keep each other going. There was a kind of a code we'd have to, you know, get, a, get your mug of tea. Get your, I'll be there with my slippers and the fag, or whatever she'd say. I'll be, and then we'd, we'd yeah, we'd, we were always there and needed to, needed to be. And she saved me. She saved me a couple of times, actually. And she'd held me till I'd answer the phone. And uh, she was just a really good fr friend. And I loved her so much, you know. Uh, she's brilliant. You're saying there she saved you. What, in, in what ways? Ah, uh, there you go, digging away. No, oh, no, I mean, like, <laughs> you can, you can um, always tell me to feck off. I mean... I will. Um, I, I, I mean, the first time I really got to know uh, Sinead was um, uh, when I was doing my music show, the Mel de May show. It must be... must be about 12 years ago. And... Uh, we were, she was on it and we'd met before and, and said hello, but I, I mean, get to know, to know somebody. Mm. Um, and uh, I was going through a tough time and she said to me, how are you? And I said, fine. And she said, no, how are you? And she spotted something immediately. And she, she'd always go. She smelt it. She'd go in, it, she'd go, she'd always, she'd get to there. Yeah. And um, she changed the song we were supposed to do. And she said, I want to do this song every night about this time. Yeah. And we didn't rehearse it, really. We ran through it a couple of times, the guys. And, and, uh, and then before I know it, we were singing it. And it was one of the most heartfelt duets I've ever sung. And Sinead would never sing it un unless she felt it. She'd just scrap it and not do it unless she was really true to it. And I always, uh, yeah, I'll take that from her. Just scrap it unless you totally feel it, yeah. Yeah. One, one of the many things, one of the many things. She was brilliant, yeah. Um, you mentioned your dad there, and yeah. uh, he died in January. I know, I felt and like a funeral singer this year. But, but uh, well, what, yeah. was, what was amazing about him, looking from a distance, was he seemed like a man who knew how to live life. He seemed like a man who knew when to laugh. He seemed like a man who made other people laugh and put a smile yeah. in people's faces there. This is him at the, uh, at the premiere with you. I know. Yeah. <laughs> well, that actually wasn't a premiere. I have to tell you a secret on that. Um, that's the premiere of the, the movie I did, Fisherman's Friends. That was the first movie I, I did, did. And um, my dad was so excited about the premiere. And uh, we had a premiere in Cornwall. That's where, where we did it for all the local people where we'd been filming. So dad said, so when are we doing the Dublin premiere? And I rang them up, the producers, and they said, that's it. And I didn't have the heart to tell Dad, so we created a premiere in Dublin for Dad. Brilliant! <laughs> and you just did the whole thing. Amazing. Yeah. Amazing. We got the red carpet out. I think somebody tipped off a couple of paps, the photographers, to tell them. We got them as tucks. That's brilliant. And, uh, and my brothers and sisters didn't know that until the funeral. And I said, did you not notice there was nobody from the movie there <laughs> except <laughs> us? <laughs> <laughs> and I hired out the cinema. Before, before we let you go, uh, you posted a thing which, which made me laugh and uh, he was laughing through it as well. This was he was her, hilarious. He was, he was setting bonkers. Up, this was setting up his answering machine. This was his answer, his voicemail for his answering machine for about five years. He couldn't even get through this without laughing. He's listen, mad. Listen to this. This, mad. Is, uh, this is Tony. Hello, this is Tony. Uh, I cannot take your call just at the moment. So if you just leave your uh, a message, I are ahead <laughs> 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 I know. <laughs> so, so good. I know. That, that's, the, that's the answer machine message we all want. We all want. That'll do. He was buried with his clown nose on. That's what he wanted. He, wanted to, he said, I don't want anyone crying. I want just laugh. And he does clown nose. And we got a load of balloons and put them all around and uh, got him some plastic daffodils and a little squeezy thing out of his lapel. And we all had, we all laughed and we party poppers around the grave. And he said, I want just laugh. Because he made everyone happy all the time, so we did what he wanted.